I'm Rebecca Rausch. I run the bicycle program at Sound Transit. I'm going to start out and I'm going to be brief about some of the projects that we're working on right now, and then Chris is um, going to talk about ST3. So um, Sound Transit has a bicycle program. It's about 10 years old now, and uh, we are working on some projects right now that I want to make sure that you are aware of. We opened up a bike cage on Beacon Hill. I went and talked to Beacon Hill Safe Streets last week. Uh, it has a capacity to hold 48 bikes. It's, um, the technology right now is fairly rudimentary. It's a keypad, so each person who subscribes to it, $50 a year, um, gets a unique code that they use to use the bike cage. We also have a bike cage at the Tuckola Sounder Station. Same code will get people in, able to use that. And uh, we're opening up a station um, later this year. Some of you may not be aware of it. We're opening up a light rail station south of the airport at Angle Lake. And that will also have a bike cage. We opened uh, in March um, two new stations at Capitol Hill and the University of Washington. And it's been a remarkable change for bicyclists who are coming from the north. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, bicyclists on board, a lot of bicyclists parking at the University of Washington. Very few bicyclists parking at Capitol Hill. Um, we've done bike counts since the station opened. There has been no more than one bicycle parked at Capitol Hill. And uh, an assignment for Tom that we've discussed this on social media is to try to figure out why that might be. I have some theories, but I'm not sure exactly why that is. University of Washington, we opened with 130 bicycle parking spaces. The university very kindly loaned us, uh, for the time being, some additional bike racks until we can add more there. Um, the bike counts there the, have been robust. A lot of people are bicycling there, parking their bikes there. A lot of people are also taking their bikes on the trains. Prior to um, U-Link opening, we wanted to make sure the bicyclists were reminded about what we allow on trains and what we don't, uh, for, primarily for safety reasons. Um, we put a limit on the number of bikes that are allowed on trains and the types of bikes that are allowed on trains. And that was met with some warmth, um, pri primarily from people who uh, want more bikes on board or want larger bikes on board. But it, it truly is a safety issue. And if you are on a bike, or if you're on a train, and I've seen this myself, and there's three or four bikes where there should be one or two, you see what the safety issues are mm -hmm. with all those bikes on the trains. We are currently um, looking, uh, considering proposals from light, car, light rail car manufacturers for ST2 cars, which will be the ones that go east, and uh, it looks like we'll be able to increase the capacity on those trains for bicycles, which is great. Um, when Capitol Hill, the Capitol Hill station, if you're familiar with it, right now uh, everything around the station buildings is asphalt. That's going to be developed for transit-oriented development. Once that development is done, we'll go back in and put a bike cage in there. So we'll be able to have secure bike parking there also, although apparently there won't be a need for it. Well, that's, that's <laughs> true, I know, yeah. I, I'm joking. Um, what else? All future facilities, um, including the Northgate extension and going north to, to Linwood and um, going east and continuing south, will have a combination of racks and lockers and cages. We're moving toward cages because you can hold a lot more bikes in a cage. And frankly, lockers look like plaza turds. They're really, they're, and they're not useful. They're useful for some folks, but not useful for the majority of people. We're also doing a um, feasibility study right now on on-demand bike parking. I don't know if any of you have had an opportunity to use the on-demand lockers that um, Metro has out now at 10 facilities as a pilot project. They're going to continue with it. Use a smart card. It's like a debit card that you load up and you tap on a locker, the door opens, you put your bike in there, you come back later, tap again, the door opens, and you're only charged by the hour. And it's usually about five cents an hour. That's what I'm hoping to be able to do at our future facilities. It'll be a much better use of the real estate that's given to bike parking. And that's a high level overview. Uh, I'll leave cards here too if you have any questions about anything I've reported on. Don't hesitate to contact me. I'm going to hand over to Chris. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks for uh, having me here today. So I'm Chris Rule, and uh, I'm on the planning group at ST that's okay. working on the ST3 package. Uh, I've been focused mostly on the Seattle area corridors, as well as system access and some other programmatic elements of uh, this plan. So I'll try and be really quick about an overview of the plan, uh, get to a little bit about that system access and some new features in ST3. Uh, so that we have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Sound Transit system, 
Um, uh, as Rebecca mentioned, we just opened the U-Link extension. In uh, 2021, we'll open the Northgate Link extension with three new stations. By 2023, our system will extend from uh, Linwood in the north uh, to uh, Redmond Technology Center in the east across Lake Washington, and then down to Kent Des Moines in 2023. Uh, so this is the ST2 system uh, that was uh, approved by the voters in 2008. Um, and with that system, we expect uh, ridership to more than double where it is today. Um, we had a big bump in ridership immediately as the new stations opened. Uh, we expect that to uh, continue to grow. Uh, and by 2025, we expect over 100 million riders on that system. Um, but we're also planning beyond 2025, looking out to 2040 when we expect uh, a lot more people in the region and how we get the capacity for those folks uh, on high capacity transit. Uh, so we've been looking at a third measure uh, for Sound Transit. We were formed in 1996 uh, with the first one that was called Sound Move. This would be a third one and we go through a, a statutory process that the, the legislature defines. Uh, we start with a long-range plan, uh, so a couple of years ago uh, we, we studied sort of what are the major corridors we're meant to serve. Uh, and so one of the major additions in the long-range plan was uh, West Seattle, uh, which, you know, 10 years ago it was anticipated that, maybe 12 years ago at this point, it was anticipated that the monorail would serve that corridor. So now both Ballard and West Seattle are in our long-range plan. Um, we also were able to do some sort of logical next steps type studies in 2014 uh, and interesting to you folks, we did a transit access uh, issue paper uh, that went through some, you know, thinking about some best practices as we move forward as we develop the package. So last year we received additional authority from the legislature to seek uh, some tax revenue from the district. Um, and we went through a process of narrowing down over the you know, more than 400 projects in our uh, EIS uh, for the long range plan, getting that down to a, a reasonable number and the, the priority projects that people would like to see in the next plan. Um, so we released, uh, our, our board uh, put out a draft plan in March uh, that will be the ST3 plan with some modifications and, and we are in an outreach period uh, that um, the most intense part of just wrapped up in April, uh, but our board is going to continue refining the approach and the uh, projects included in the plan so we can get to uh, a final plan in, in June so we can be ready for the ballot in November. Uh, so this um, plan would complete what's called the spine uh, from Everett to Tacoma and out to downtown Redmond and additionally uh, we would be looking at more light rail extensions to uh, downtown Redmond, Issaquah, uh, then additional uh, uh, Tacoma Link extensions, in, and uh, the West Seattle and Ballard corridors would be funded. Um, so our midpoint estimate of ridership for that system in 2040 is uh, over a half a million riders per day. So in the central corridor, as I mentioned, the, the biggest projects are the West Seattle and Ballard uh, light rail corridors. We're also looking at infill stations along the existing line at uh, Graham Street and Boeing Access Road, and then studies for more logical next steps. So uh, at the north end, uh, do we go east towards UW and on to the east side, or do we you know, go up north through Crown Hill and over towards Greenwood, Northgate, etc. On to 522, or do we do you know do we design the system to do both of those things, for example? And then uh, another one of those studies is south from the Alaska Junction down to Burien. Um, the the way the light rail corridors are um, in the plan, uh, the timeline is you know 25 years, uh, and we expect the, the extensions to open up roughly in pairs. So our Federal Way and Redmond, uh, uh, to downtown Redmond, are uh, the long, farthest along the environmental process, so those would open first. Um, the Tacoma and West Seattle projects uh, would open next in 2033. Uh, right now we're looking at a, a Linwood to south 
uh, Everett in uh, 2036, as well as those infill stations in Seattle. Um, 2038 is uh, the Ballard to Downtown project. Because of the complexity of the downtown tunnel and, and the uh, construction involved in that, as well as the financing of that line. Um, and then the final extensions would be uh, out to Issaquah and into downtown uh, Everett. Um, also of interest, we're looking at a, a BRT line that would serve um, 405, as well as a 145th Street BRT that goes out along 522. And that would give about five cities easy access to the station at 145th that will be built as part of Linwood Link. Um, we also have, uh, I should mention, uh, at 130th Street, uh, we have a potential addition. So it's in there as a provisional station. We just don't have room in the financial capacity of the plan the way it's structured right now. Um, but if funding did become available in the future, as it stands in that plan, 130th could be moved forward if it was approved by the voters. And uh, as I mentioned, there are some sort of next logical steps uh, as far as the, the environmental studies and, and future um, corridors that we could look at for, say, an ST4. Um, we also have some early deliverables because of the long timeline. We've heard a lot about trying to um, speed up buses in the meantime, whether it's the pre-rail corridors like uh, the C and D lines, uh, as well as uh, some parking, uh, as well as sort of bus on shoulder opportunities on corridors like I-5 that are very congested to get buses moving traffic. Um, and so as I mentioned, yes, it's a long uh, delivery timeline, but if, if you look at it sort of as the system grows, we are opening major investments every few years. Um, so that's going to stretch sort of the capacity of the agency to deliver on those things, even with this new additional revenue. Uh, so the way that breaks down is uh, mostly sales tax, um, and then uh, an MVET, which is a, a license tab tax based on the value of people's vehicles, uh, as well as uh, property tax, which is the smallest source uh, of tax revenue in the plan. Uh, and then some other revenue, we're looking at fares. Uh, we have an assumption that we would get some federal funding uh, and some other sources, uh, such as the uh, ST2 remaining funds as those start to recover after the ST2 plan is built. Uh, so on a year of expenditure basis, looking out 25 years, uh, that total is over $50 billion. Um, I'm going to share some numbers with you so that $200 per year is for a sort of an average adult, or $17 per month. That's sort of a you know, 2016 amount. Uh, in 2014 dollars, uh, I'm going to talk about some uh, access investments. So our board has recognized that um, the biggest <coughs> challenge we get with ridership is people accessing the station. Um, and so our station budgets already do accommodate uh, the design and have some flexible uh, design allowances to look at um, how we interact with the, the pedestrian and bike environment around the station, um, including bike parking, uh, basically every mode of, of transportation that people use to access the station is generally covered for the footprint surrounding the station. Um, since ST2, we've done some looking around and, and decided that it would be really a good idea to make some additional investments around the stations. So in addition to you know parking, um, bus transfer facilities, uh, we have a lot of money in the plan for additional bike and walking improvements. Um, not just very close to the station, but we're going to look for ways on the local streets that we can improve the paths to the station. And the, the biggest source of those funds in the plan is what we call a non-motorized access allowance uh, within the plan. That could be you know, from uh, $100,000 uh, for, say, an arterial BRT station to $4.5 million for a, a suburban station that has some major access challenges uh, and potentially could be a bike intercept. We would look at some ways 
to partner with cities uh, or other par partners, uh, major institutions, to lower the cost of those improvements so that we could work, you know, potentially reimburse them. Uh, you know, they could you know, perform the uh, implementation and we could reimburse them. So as Sound Transit, it, it reduces our workload. Uh, we don't have to apply for permits on their streets. That's been a major challenge uh, in the past as, as uh, Sound Transit goes into every com community, uh, trying to keep uh, budgets and scope and schedule on track um, while dealing with things that are outside that station area. Um, so this is an allowance because we are uh, really looking to de define the precise station locations uh, later uh, after the environmental and design process. This is my last slide. Great. <laughs> Very helpful. Yeah. So um, the last thing I'll mention is the system access fund. And this is a programmatic approach. Uh, so across all of our stations, both existing and new stations, uh, we're looking at programming about uh, $20 million to do studies and ongoing data collection uh, to improve the tools that we have to figure out what are the cost, cost effective uh, improvements that we can use to um, improve ridership to our stations. Um, about 80% of the program is capital improvements, $77 million of that is direct um, bike and ped access improvements. Um, so we're looking to prioritize those um, and figure out what kinds of projects will be eligible um, as we move forward and, and we're looking for some guidance from our board on that and uh, you know, what has the most ridership, the lowest cost, is supported in local plans and policies, and um, really has public support, are the four main criteria that are already in our system access policy. Um, but we will get to some sort of specific implementation uh, later on with our board as they get a chance to weigh in. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. I, I know there are questions, and I want to um, move on to the second part of our agenda. And just to segue from that, we do have our working group that will continue to provide some input up within the timeline that, that you need. And I think this is the beginning of a collaboration between SBAP to give input. So this is something that comes onto the table to be ongoing in the relationship with you to keep informing how this impacts bicycles and how we can advise them. Mike? Just quick, quick clarification for the notes. Can you go back two slides? One more. Yeah. The first bullet, that's $4.5 million for each station, totaling $270 million? Yeah, up to. Up to. Up to. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, and so the allowance is actually a construction dollar amount. Then we have sort of uh, costs that pile on top of that. And just to close, too, I think we all are excited about the new station's opening, and it's a perfect example. If you build a they will come, and the bicyclists are coming, and we'll talk more about what happens with John and Broadway okay. <laughs> um, to keep building. But now that we actually have it, and we have it coordinated with where people are with bikes, we've got real stuff happening to have conversations with what we can do going forward. So thank you. Okay. Chris, and thank well. you for back very much.